Why is there no end in sight to the war on Yemen? What is the impact of seven years of armed conflict on ordinary Yemenis? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Moin Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with the award-winning filmmaker, Safa Al-Ahmed. Safa Al-Ahmed is a Saudi journalist and filmmaker. Her work on Yemen during the past decade reflects the bloody trajectory of the conflicts within the country and their international impact. It has earned her four Emmy nominations, her Yemen Under Siege received two Emmy Awards in 2017. Al-Ahmad is a recipient of the Index on Censorship Freedom of Expression Award for Journalism, the El Mundo Award for Journalism, and the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression International Press Freedom Award. In 2014, her Saudi secret uprising won the Association of International Broadcasting Best International Investigation Award. Safa Al Ahmed, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thank you for having me. I'd like to begin by asking you to provide an overview of the current state of the conflict and the resulting conditions endured by the people of Yemen. Are we witnessing a single conflict or rather a series of interrelated ones playing out in different parts of the country? And why is the current struggle for control of Ma'rib considered so significant? My God. Okay, that's a mouthful of an answer. I'll I'll try to briefly give you just some historical uh, dates and how we got here, just for sure. people who are not aware of the full trajectory of the conflict. That'd and be so very useful. Yeah. To to answer your question from from the get go, the conflict had many layers, right? And so, if you ask anyone in Yemen about the conflict, that they would have different views on when the conflict started, right? So there isn't to the Yemeni people a singular moment in time where uh, the, the conflict started. There's the obvious one, obviously, that everybody knows, which is 2015 when the Saudi-led coalition uh, waged war on Yemen, right? But many would argue, and I would be one of them, is that it started way before that. When Ali Abdullah Saleh, who used to be the president of Yemen for over three decades, launched a war on a small, tiny little area in northern Yemen called Saada, right, which is on the border with Saudi Arabia. And with consecutive exactly six wars since, since then, until it stopped in 2010, with the excuse that they are backed by the Iranians. Right. So the rhetoric of that the Iranians are the ones who are supporting the Houthis was a very old one started by Ali Saleh at the time. Right. And you'll see numerous reports, especially by the Americans, saying that there is nothing to support a, such involvement as Ali Saleh was claiming. Right. But as things started progressing and with obviously the revolution that started in 2011, the army itself started splitting, right? And without going into details about who split and why and, and, and how they were involved with the Saada wars, what, what happened is that the Houthis, who had been in consecutive wars with the, Saudi, with the Yemeni government, got closer and closer to Sana'a. Right. Without the Yemeni government actually attempting to stop them. So when they a lot of people would argue that um, uh, Amran, which is uh, northern uh, uh, and one of the biggest uh, just be uh, on the way to Sana'a, when, when they were taken over by the Houthis, that that should have been an indicator for the Yemeni government that something is serious. Right. They surround Sana'a and the government still doesn't do anything. And miraculously, in September 2014, within three days, Starting on the 18th, the Houthis launch an attack on Sana'a and take over the capital of Yemen, right? Without any real opposition from the Yemeni government. And from there on, I would say that the conflict had escalated and unraveled in ways nobody were, were really thought could happen in Yemen, right? And so with that, the, 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 the Houthis kept changing the signposts of why they are taking over more and more areas uh, of Yemen, right? With Sana'a, they were claiming it, it was uh, the, uh, the lifting of the support of the price of gas, right? And they're like, people can't afford it. I don't know. And so they kept having different slogans of why they were expanding, expanding. Shifting more, the goalposts. Right? 
Exactly, which sounds familiar, right? Because when we come to when the Saudis get involved in this war, because the Houthis refused to stop, they, they went through Rada, which is in, in the area of Baydha, and kept going south and south until they reached Aden. Mm-hmm. Right. When they reached Aden, then the Saudis started to get involved, right, with the claim that Hadi, who had fled Yemen by then, and by the way, we we're talking sorry, about uh, Abdul Mansur uh, Hadi, Abdul Rabbu Mansur Abdur Abdur Hadi, who, sorry, the, the, who the successor be, of Ali Abdullah Saleh, who used to be his vice president for three yes. days, right? Like, so, like it's all really the same players doing these things, right? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, Abdul Rabbu Mansur Hadi was actually in Sana'a. Mm-hmm. Right. For the longest time, even after the Houthis had taken over. Right. And he, I, he resigned so many times. I can't even remember. Right. Like there's even a constitutional debate whether he was still president at the time or not. Right. Until he had to flee to Aden. From Aden, he fled to Riyadh. Right. And so there's a lot of these internal conversations about, OK, the legitimacy of any one of these entities, right? But in the end, okay, let's say, let's say Hadi's government is what is internationally recognized as the government, the legitimate government of Yemen, right? So, the, and then the war starts in March of 2015. This is and when the Saudi-led co- coalition uh, launches its attacks on uh, Yemen. With, with, of course, the rest of the Gulf yes. and uh, Qatar was involved at the time. Yeah and the UAE, right? And so from there, and each one of the warring parties had supporters, right? And so if we're talking about the Saudi uh, and uh, UAE-led coalition, obviously they had the American support during Obama's time, so during the Democrats, and then you had the French and the Italians who were selling weapons uh, uh, to them and stuff, and then you had the Houthis, who importantly, and this is why I bring up the Saida wars in the beginning, to understand the context of whatever little relationship and support that the Houthis had with the Iranians grew. Right, because now they're even more and more isolated. And the only two embassies that lasted the longest since Sanan stayed open were the Iranian embassy and the Russian embassy. Right. And so with that, it was basically it was, the, the, the Saudis created more of a relationship between the Houthis and the Iranians out of necessity, right? Because the, the Houthis didn't have any more allies, right? Well, well claiming so, this relationship was a, was a main was the justification for their, uh, for the, for their intervention. And, and, and to me, one of the most dangerous things that I saw while in Yemen is that a country that wasn't really sectarian at all. I mean, because like, if you understand that, it, like a lot of the Northern area, there, there were Zaydis, right? And so Zaydis are technically Shia, right? But they are a different school from the Twelvers, which is most of the followers in Iran, right? And, 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 so and, there and was... there's a number of theological um, uh, aspects, I think closer to, let's say, to mainstream Sunni. Sunni than mainstream uh, uh, Shia. For sure, right? right? And so like all these little minutiae that weren't really an issue before became an integral of how the different warring parties were trying to recruit people to their side, right? And so that became an, uh, an important element of understanding how the different warring parties were uh, virtual signaling to other groups about this stuff, right? Like, so when I was in, in, uh, in Najaf and Karbala, uh, during the Arbi'in, for example, for a different story, you in had Iraq, posters right. of Yem- uh, in Iraq, right? It's in, in southern Iraq. You had posters supporting the Houthis, and the, everybody was talking about the Houthis. And in Najaf, people were surprised that the Houthis weren't Twelvers. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I don't even know. <laughs> anyway, so that's all. That's all. But like th- those sect- those sectarian divides became an issue during the war because the warring parties saw it as beneficial to do so. Right? right, and that is really dangerous because you already know on the ground you had Al Qaeda also operating, right, with its d- different offshoots, and then later on uh, ISY, as in uh, is the, the Islamic State in Yemen, also appeared, right, with their own interest in how to use that sectarian language to a- attract recruits. So right? identity then, became weaponized. 
Absolutely. I mean, like everywhere else in the, in the, in the Middle East, the, the, these things have, I mean, because and I mentioned this because I am allergic to people saying that these conflicts are religious, right? It, because they're not, we need to understand that these are tools that people use to get people uh, to take one side or the other. Right? Instruments and, and, and in a political struggle. Yeah. And understanding that is vital, right? Like, yeah, anyways, sorry, I, I was trying to say something in a nutshell and not end up <laughs> in a tangent. No, not at all. So, so what we 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 what we what we come to now is that the, when the Saudis came and they did succeed in pushing the Houthis out of Aden, right? And pushing them away uh, back into the traditional uh, northern area. As the Houthis always had that accept, uh, ex- expansionist uh, intentions in uh in yemen right which brings us to the moment now which is matter right but okay so when you want to understand why would the houthis want to expand in a way that would bring even more conflict and uh and um and front lines to them is because of resources right and so the northern yemen which is basically almost 70 percent of the population of yemen is under houthi control right but Oil and gas, which are the most important uh, income streams in in Yemen, are in the southern parts uh, of Yemen, right? And so to understand those resources and distribution, then you understand why these different warring parties are trying those, like, for example, Hodeida and Adan are important ports. And so it was very important for the Houthis to maintain Hodeida because they had lost Adan, so they lost their access to all these things. And so now what you see are these front lines that come and go, but now Ma'rib is, is, is the largest of them because they're fighting over the, these resources, right? Hodeida was frightening, as in if there was a full-on conflict within Hodeida, the city, I, I don't know how many uh, c- civilians would have been casualties of, of that confrontation, right? But now what is happening, it is even more frightening in Ma'rib. It's because we didn't have what happened in, in Syria, for example. With, with the border with Turkey, a lot of people were able to leave Syria and cross over to, to Turkey as refugees, right? In Yemen, they very few people had that privilege of leaving the country, right? Most are IDPs or internally displaced, right? And so a lot of the internally displaced Yemenis ended up in Madrid. So a population of 360,000 became 3 million. And which is now um, the most um, hotly contested space in the country. Exactly. So 3 million, that's a, that's a huge number for any city to, uh, to incorporate, right? Sure. And now sure. that they're besieged, now these people are now becoming displaced yet again, right? And so with that, the, the, the Houthis, with full knowledge, understand that they, they are able to put a lot of pressure on the Hadi government in Riyadh, right? And to hopefully, what they're hoping, not hopefully, but what the Houthis are hoping is to put new realities on the ground to force the UN and the Saudis to come to an agreement with the Houthis, with the Houthis having the upper hand, right? And which explains, frankly, I think what was happening in the Security Council uh, yesterday with the UAE abstaining on the vote on Ukraine, because they were they, they were hoping to get something out, out of these agreements by uh, stating that the Houthis are t- designated as a terrorist organization, right? Yeah. And so all of this, I mean, it, it, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk. We'll talk about Ukraine later. But all of these are uh, all of these different parties, even though that everybody had on on the record agreed that there's only a peaceful solution through dialogue, and there's no winning this war uh, a, 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 with arms in, a, in Yemen. Yet everybody continues to do so. Right. Just, right. just to be clear, you're you're saying that the UAE abstained on um, the resolution uh, condemning uh, the Russia. Russian invasion in Ukraine in exchange for Russian support of the Emirati wish to see the Security Council label the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Is that right? I mean, as everybody else, we're all trying to read tea leaves about what the UAE is going to do in their position in the Security Council, right? But then just an hour before now, 
uh, all of the Gulf monarchies did actually vote for the resolution in the General Assembly yes. against yes. Uh, Russia, right? And so I don't know why abstain in the Security Council and then uh, vote yes in the General Assembly. Somebody that understands the UN a lot more and it, all, all these strategies can uh, can explain mm -hmm. it better. But it was really interesting to observe why would they do that, right? But but if we return to uh, Ma'rib, would it be accurate to characterize it as, as the gateway to the South and that it holds importance because it's much easier to control um, the, the energy resources in Yemen once you take control of Ma'rib? Well, it, it's one of the gateways uh, to the south, right? So they, they obviously tried with Aden, right? And that, that had failed. And they, they got really close again last year, right? They lost Shebwa, which also has a huge gas uh, and, uh, uh, and oil reserves, which uh, the UAE sponsored uh, armed groups uh, were able to, to push them out. But also Bayra which is the, the central part uh, of Yemen in the heart between the north and the south, has constantly been a front line between the Houthis and, uh, and uh, the tribes, uh, the militia, the different militias, like everybody uh, of all, uh, ISY is very active there, Al-Qaeda is very active there, like everybody is active in Beba, right? And so it, it, it is, it, it, I don't think the Houthis have ever stopped trying to expand back into the south. It's just a matter of also seeing what is most strategic for each one of the yeah. groups at, the, at, at certain times. And, they, and, the, and it's an ebb and flow for a long time yeah. now, right? And, and Nobody can think, strategically win, right? Well, that, I was about to say, you're painting a picture in which the Houthis are incapable of seizing control of the country and the Saudis- Completely not. Yeah. And, and the Saudis are incapable of defeating the Houthis. I mean, I mean, a friend of mine was saying it's uh, it's not because the Houthis are strong; it's because their enemies are weak, right? And, and divided, yeah. and and definitely divided, right? And we'll yeah. go into the uh, the south the Southern Transitional uh, Council and all of those. Basically, even if you look at Aden, which is the first city that w fell under the control of the Saudi-led coalition and the so-called uh, Hadi government, right? Look at it now. The security there is a disaster, right? Uh, the infrastructure is a disaster. Electricity is non-existent. The garbage issues, like if you follow what's going on inside Aden, right? And this has nothing to do with the Houthis, right? If the Saudi coalition knew how to run anything successfully, it should be in Adam because it is now technically uh, the functional uh, uh, capital of, uh, uh, of the government, right? And none of that is being seen there. And we're talking about, uh, for example, uh, before the, the, the importance of understanding why it, we're saying Yemen is being starved and it's not starving, right? And the distinction is important because all of Yemen is being starved, regardless of who's in control of the different areas. Because all the different warring parties are so corrupt and so inept. And, and, and that takes me um, to my next question, which is I'd like to ask you about the nature of the humanitarian emergency in Yemen. Is, is it a byproduct of the armed conflict or is it a strategy with a purpose? Um, and perhaps you could also indicate how it connects with the environmental degradation that Yemen is experiencing. I mean, as you know, Yemen was always one of the poorest countries in the world and always struggled with providing basic services to its people, right? And so it never, I, I mean, if you read any article, even before 2014, you will see Yemen on the brink. Right. This is the, 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 the most favorite. The headline that always works. Right. Yeah. Because it will always and sadly always be accurate when it comes to Yemen. Right. So yeah. I'm not saying that was a rosy situation before the war started. And now it's it's become what it is. Right. But I'm saying because it was so fragile to begin with, the war collapsed, whatever little uh, connective tissue that there was left to keep things going, right? And in, a, in an odd way, it's also what saved it because the, 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 Yemeni, uh, the Yemeni people were so used to having a central inept government, 
right? They had to find different ways of making ends meet. For example, in Sana'a, no, most people have solar, right? Not because of environmental stuff that we will get to, but because they've given up on actually having any functional electricity of any sort since the war began, right? And, and electricity was a huge issue even before that, right? And so all of these things cause a, a massively deteriorating situation in ways that is really hard to comprehend because also, and I'm sure we'll talk about this as well, how badly the conflict is covered, right? And so when we're talking about or not in it's starving the people, I would say yes. And I think a lot of uh, specialists are looking at uh, what's going on in Yemen. It's, it's strategic, right? To put pressure on different parties of uh, this is a favor, here you go, you, th this is the aid that you can have that others can't. And this is across the board, right? All the political parties are doing this. All the militias are doing this. It's not one or the other. Everybody is doing this, right? And so this is causing a massive issue within the country. And it's not about resources of like, is there actual food in the country? You can go to supermarket in, uh, in Sana'a, for example, and uh, find food in the supermarket, right? Or any other place in Yemen. The issue is, and this ties to the economy and the collapse of the economy, is that can people afford to buy the food, right? When people have not been paid for six, seven months easily, some for years, that the, the ones who used to work for the government, right? So government employees who no Civil longer servants. have access, right? Yeah. But also because as part of the war, and this is a whole fascinating tangent of the, the Central Bank of Yemen split, right? So there's a Central Bank of Yemen in Sana'a because you have to have one legally, as my understanding is in the world of been acknowledging, it has to be within the capital, right? And then the split of another branch of the central bank being in Aden, right? But one Aden has the money and Sana'a has the signatures. And so the, the, the fight between the two of who gets to have control over what money and resources. Total dysfunction. Exactly. So yeah, and he, as, as they say in Yemen, Asid. <laughs> It's a, it's a complete mess. I'm sorry, it's not funny. It's just, it blows my mind how complicated the issue is, right? And how little interest there was in really unraveling the situation on the ground so that we can truly understand who, who is benefiting from these things, right? And, who, and, and, and how to fix it, right? And, and so it is definitely a strategy. Like last time I was in Yemen, I was in Shabwa. And they're talking about malnutrition in their kids, right? And, the, and these are what you would consider like the family I was staying with, you could consider a middle-class family, right? And they were talking about malnutrition because it's so hard to get access, right? Now, because of the environmental disaster that is Yemen, right? Because of the conflict, because of all these compounding things, we have cholera. People are dying of cholera, which is what just access to clean water. It is as simple as that. Right, where all the different parties, and it's not just in the northern areas where the Houthis uh, have control. It's all over the country, right? And so the, the Saudis are indefensible. The, the Yemeni uh, government it doesn't have a defensible uh, position to, in why their areas are, are like this as well. They can't bl blame the Houthis for everything. They can blame the Houthis for a lot of things, right? The Houthis are no... Uh, uh, champions of human rights, their record is abysmal on the ground, right? But when it comes to who is starving Yemeni people, I would say all, all of them are complicit. So, so the four horsemen of the apocalypse truly have uh, visited upon, uh, upon Yemen. And, and if I understand you correctly, there's now widespread hunger, um, uh, uh, spread of uh, uh, disease and a genuine humanitarian emergency throughout the country and not just in a place like uh, Ma'rib, which is now on the front lines of, of the conflict. Right. And I mean, and to make matters worse, I, just before going on, uh, going on this interview with you, I saw an article that uh, the conflict in the Ukraine is now going to cause wheat shortages in Yemen. Right, because yeah. they get a lot of the resort, uh, their wheat from there, and how people are now stockpiling wheat in Yemen because they're worried that there's going to be a shortage, and then the chain of supply will stop in Yemen. I'm like, oh my god, the, the poor Yemenis—they can't catch a break. Like even with a conflict that is 
thousands of miles away, they are one of the first to be impacted by it. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to turn now to um, some of the regional dimensions of, of this mm -hmm. conflict. Foreign wars often produce heightened repression um, at home. In, in this case, how have the domestic policies of the Gulf Cooperation Council states responded to the Yemen conflict? We've talked about how it's operated in Yemen, but I'd mm -hmm. be interested to learn from you um, what the impact has been in, in the GCC states and also about the impact the conflict has had on the sizable Yemeni uh, communities in, in the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia. Mm, I mean, I mean, we all know that the, uh, the lack of respect for human rights and freedom of speech in the Gulf, right? And so that, that is something that's independent of this war or not. Uh, but sadly, what happened when they're, you know, they're drumming people for support of going to war uh, uh, with Yemen is that they stifled all criticism and any possibility of being critical of the war, right, within the GCC, uh, within the, the Gulf uh, Corporation Council. So, for example, the famous human rights activist, one of his uh, accusations for- Sorry, you, you briefly froze. I'd like to ask you to repeat um, his name. So Nabil Rajab, who is a, a famous human rights in uh, activist in Bahrain, yep. uh, one of the allegations against him that uh, put him in prison was a tweet against the war in Yemen, right? So they had made it a criminal act to be critical of the war. Right. And this goes with them. I mean, these governments don't want uh, criticism at all of any of their policies. But if I'm not but, mistaken, Bahrain is, is not a participant in, in, in the war. They were in the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So they, they were part of the coalition. Yeah. I, I mean, as insignificant as that participation is, but they still would not tolerate any uh, um, a criticism uh, of the war, especially from somebody like uh, Nabil Rajab, right? There is a person that was arrested in Kuwait for being critical of the, of the war in Yemen, right? Within Saudi Arabia itself, you couldn't be critical uh, at all, right? And so it, it just reflected what was anyways the policy of specifically Saudi Arabia and the, and the UAE of being intolerant of any criticism of any of their policies, right? But this is this is a war. People are killing Yemenis and justifying that, right? And it's now we 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 are nearly eight years of a, a, a war in Yemen with no end in sight and no real debate within Saudi Arabia itself, let alone, and I'll speak more specifically on Saudi on this one, of no real understanding of why we're at war, right? Th this whole craziness about like we are fighting Iran right if via the Houthis as if that justified anything but in the end we all know that they are going to sit down with the Houthis and figure a way out and then what would be for all these people who died in Yemen what was that for mm -hmm. right and, and this is sadly like I mean in Yemen they, they used to uh, tell me it's like oh the Saudis will fight to the last Yemeni and uh, against the Houthis, and uh, that's sadly true. Well, and 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 since you mentioned um, uh, both Saudi and Iran, to what extent does uh, regional polarization, particularly between these two states, play a role in uh, in the conflict and the absence of its resolution? I mean, the Saudis use it as an excuse for sure, right? as in this tension between them and, uh, and Iran. And for Iran, this is the cheapest conflict that they're involved in, frankly, right? What, what, what do they have to lose? I mean, if you're gonna compare how many people died on the Iranian side in this war, you know, like I don't think any, right? There's no, no Iranians on the ground in, uh, in the front lines uh, fighting with the Houthis. More, uh, more UAE soldiers died in the beginning of this conflict than, uh, than them, right? And so they're not really losing anything, uh, the Iranians, by being involved in this, uh, in this conflict, as much as the Yemenis themselves and everybody else that is on the ground in, in Yemen itself, right? And so a proxy war yeah. to the last Yemeni. To the last Yemeni, you're on all sides, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm a bit 
like when they say, oh, we need to resolve uh, the relationship, uh, the the problems between the Saudis and the Iranians, it's like, go oh, fucking deal with it directly. Yeah, and you want, why do you have to go fight in Yemen? You just have to cross a gulf. Yeah, I mean, we that is closer than going to fight in Yemen. So I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of Iran being used as the excuse to kill Yemenis, when in reality, when it comes to it, if they have to make peace with the Houthis, they will. Mm -hmm. Right. But it, it does seem that, um, you know, as, as we've discussed, that um, Saudi Arabia um, used the pretext of reducing Iranian influence on the Arabian Peninsula as a main justification for launching the and war. It's going so Iran. well, isn't it, Marine? Yani, well, no, but, but, influence is nearly. Yeah. But for Iran, it's actually emerged as a um, uh, very convenient way uh, to bleed and weaken the Saudis, particularly when one considers that Mohammed bin Salman um, also hoped to use this war to bolster his leadership credentials. Hmm. I, I would agree that this was an analysis at the beginning, right? Because he had just become the Minister of Defense and he and he was an unknown. And that was a great way for him uh, to to show uh, his uh, his credentials. Right. But I think uh, he is so definitely and the UAE of uh, the American school of thought of, oh, it's going to take us a few months and they're going to greet us with roses and candy and whatever. Right. And it, it's such a, a similar mentality. If you see the parallels between how the Americans talked about when they were going to invade Iraq and how what a quick a quick job that would be. Right. And the Saudis right, were talking about the same thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and look at us now. Where, where are we and how 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 close are the Saudis alleged uh, wins in this, right? And I think w w one of the, w the reasons, and this is just my reading, of uh, the pushing of the UAE of uh, in the UN Council to call the Houthis uh, or designate them a terrorist organization is that so then they can show a win, right? In the Trump administration, in the last days of the administration, they did designate them as a terrorist yep. organization, right? And then the, the Biden administration quickly took that back, right? Because the ramifications really on the Yemeni people on the ground would have been devastating, devastating, right? Regardless of what would have happened to the Houthis. So I, I, when a few years ago when I, was, when I was doing a documentary on, on the Houthis, right? Uh, what, one of the top leadership, Abu Ali al-Hakim, I asked him, so did it bother you? Because at that time they also issued um, a, a, a freeze of assets of his and, and stuff like that. And he laughed. He was like, I don't what assets? Right, man, bank account. Like, I don't care what they do. <laughs> like, they are definitely in a parallel universe of priorities and what does and doesn't impact. But something like this, because they, they are power on the ground, regardless of the individuals being banned and not being able to have bank transactions and freezing assets, the reality is it would impact all business that is it, that is flowing in territory they control yeah yeah and, and it would effectively impact all of the country and not just the territories that the houthis control but there doesn't seem to be any indication that uh, the saudis and with them the emiratis are prepared to declare victory and go home well they can't Right. I mean, the, the, this is the problem that we have now. Nobody can uh, declare victory. I mean, the, more so, the, the Houthis can, in a way, declare that because they still exist. Yeah. Right. With the, the, the insignificant resources at hand in comparison to the Saudis and the Emiratis. Right. Um. Now turning to uh, the 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 main issue of the day, if if you will. You're not, no doubt aware of the extensive discussion in the Middle East about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, or more accurately, yeah. about how the West's political response and media coverage of, uh, of Ukraine contrasts and compares with its position on invasions, wars, occupations, and refugee crises in the Middle East. As, as my daughter put it yesterday, um, the okay. contrasts drawn by the media and its coverage of Ukrainian and Middle East war refugees implies that those in the region somehow deserve their fate. Um, so as a media analyst yourself, uh, what's your take on these differences? I think <laughs> the best way I can describe it, and I think this is a feeling of many, 
I feel gaslit. Mm -hmm. I feel gaslit every day I'm watching this happen. And uh, I mean, it, it goes without saying, I'm against the war on Ukraine and uh, it, it, against the Russian invasion. Like it's, it, it not, none of this takes away from what's going on on the, on the grounds in, in the Ukraine, right? But- Yeah, and, and specifically um, point taken, but you know, this is not a discussion about Ukraine. Right, yeah. I mean, I mean, ironically, because of the discussion on Ukraine, it, it goes in stark relief to everything that we've been told was a terrorist act. Uh, uh, Palestinians cannot defend themselves, cannot uh, uh, be involved in armed struggle, that, it, it, you know, like refugees have the right un unconditionally to be welcome to other countries, right? And then uh, Syrians, Iraqis, and Afghans going, what? <laughs> you know, like, I, I cannot believe how, <laughs> when these journalists are covering, the conflict in Ukraine and not listening to themselves as they are describing them. It's like, uh, who was that guy on BBC? who was like, they're blonde, uh, blue-eyed white people. I'm like, oh my God, L like, <laughs> like there is no, it, there's no longer any pretense to, 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 to try to describe it in a way of these are humans fleeing war rather than these are white people that don't deserve to live like brown and black people, right? And that's, that's the only way I can understand how they find these, how they, 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 they the racism was coming out without, <laughs> without any filters, right? And I, and I can't, I don't, it makes me so upset, like, <sighs> well, you I don't, You've, you've, you've referenced um, Palestine and Iraq, but if we look specifically at uh, Yemen uh, for this comparison, then, and then maybe transition from, from the media coverage to um, the political level, how does U.S. policy towards Yemen um, compare? I'm sorry, Marine, you, uh, you cut yeah. off last bit. Can you, can you hear me now? I can hear you. I just lost the yeah. comparison to women. Um, so I'm saying if, if we look now at, at the political level rather than um, the media, unless you want mm -hmm. to continue on that, um, how does the um, how how does U.S. policy towards Yemen now looking specifically at Yemen compare to what to the declarations we've seen from Washington um, uh, mm -hmm. this past week? Yeah, the unconditional support. Well, uh, I mean, in, in fairness, the, the, the U.S. hasn't gotten directly involved in, in Ukraine at the uh, until now, right? And so they're, they're still debating that. But when it comes to the clarity of who's right and who's wrong, right, in the conflict, when it comes to Yemen, they've obfuscated, they've de deliberately supported uh, the Saudis, and sold them weapons and giving them unconditional support when it comes to uh, coverage of uh, them not being held for war crimes. Uh, I mean, within the UN, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the group of eminent experts uh, no longer exist. Uh, they weren't vo uh, voted to extend uh, their mandate last year. Like everything the United States has done has to support continuing the war. Right. And, and so to, to watch them be so uh, clear in their morals when it comes to Ukraine is really uh, it's it's maddening. Right. How 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 they value life is so uh, is so clear. And I, 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 I mean, we were just talking about this before going on. It's like can continue to be shocked when we shouldn't rationally be shocked anymore. Mm -hmm. um, American foreign policy is about uh, human rights and who has the dignity to be able to defend themselves and who doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so when it comes to Yemen, it's even like when you, you describe the conflict as endless, but one of the other ways the Yemen war is described as forgotten, right? But the question yeah. is, who's forgotten the war? The Yemenis didn't forget the war, right? Who are the ones who've forgotten? 
There are the commissioning editors in mainstream media who forgot to commission stories to follow up on, the, uh, on this war, unlike what's happening now when it's top of the hour, every hour on every uh, major uh, media outlet, but also it's top of the agenda of every uh, government, right? But now, because uh, you don't have Yemenis flowing into, uh, into Europe, so it's not an issue. Yeah. Well, I mean, you talk about being gaslit. What, what I found particularly telling yesterday was um, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, um, showing up at the United Nations Human Rights Council, which, as you know, is, is a body that's been consistently denounced and delegitimized because right. it has um, dealt with the issue of, of Palestinian human rights. And in, 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 the, in the exact same speech, he, like, you know, to, to, to use your phrase, absolute moral clarity on what's happening in Ukraine, but then in that same speech, urged the Human Rights Council not to investigate Israeli war crimes against the Palestinians, because in his words, um, that would uh, form a stain upon that same uh, that same body. It was it was really quite uh, quite quite a breathtaking uh, performance, and you know, also given with a straight face. And I'm sure, yeah. from his point of view, absolute sincerity because he genuinely believes this stuff. Yeah, because some people are less human than others, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. and 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 now, in a way, it's so unbelievably and painfully clear that it no longer needs a debate, right? Yeah. Like this is it. Yemeni uh, lives are not worth as much as Ukrainian lives. And this is absolutely in no way uh, like demeaning any Ukrainian or what's happening in, in the Ukraine. But come on, it's <laughs> like, how, how dare you describe people in this way and then just blatantly say that they have no right to self-defense and they have no right to complain about being basically eradicated from their land right like it's it, it's and, and this comes only you know, months after now. the uh after the afghan um uh debacle with uh, with the refugee crisis there you know where 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 um cats and dogs were being given uh priority at the, at the insistence of the british prime minister over over afghan human beings la, 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 la. i mean what happened in afghanistan is just it will take a while to unravel that one. Just, I, I mean, it, it, when the U.S. government pats itself on the back and says this is the largest evacuation in the history of the United States, I'm like, oh fuck, it. why do you like? I can't like. It just makes me like unable to put a sentence together. How maddening the shit that they're saying is with what you're saying, complete sincerity, that, oh my God, we worked so hard to evacuate these people when they don't see the problem of 20 years that has brought them to this moment, right? But they, they insist on patting themselves on the back uh, 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 with these things, right? And it is, it, it, it's just, I think we've all come to a point where it's like, okay, we need to move on from uh, like, at least I've come to that point where we are expecting the U.S. government to do better. They, this is it. This is the system, as as they were saying with Black Lives Matter, right? Like this, this is the system. It's the design, right? It's not. It's not an exception. To operating as is. designed. Yeah. Yes. This. Yeah. This is it. This is how they're operating, right? So for us to consistently expect them to do better, uh, maybe I'm saying. Uh, it's, it's just I, I've I've had enough of it. Like I I, I cannot like we we should as journalists be as critical of how uh, the U.S. gives us information as everybody else, right? Because they are uh, than anybody else. One of my experience with Pentagon, for example, right? Like it was like about how many civilians they killed in Yemen, right? They will lie. Yeah. Point blank. Um. So far, um, finally, um, you know, the, the, the title of our discussion was Yemen's Endless War. And with that in mind, I'd like to um, ask for your prognosis about uh, for Yemen uh, in 2022. Um, do you expect it to remain an endless war? 
do you see possibilities of a uh, potential uh, breakthrough in terms of movement towards uh, a resolution? What, what, what are your, or is it possible to have expectations about what might be happening in the coming months? Everything is possible, right? Because the, once the conflict is no longer making money for the warring parties on the ground, when it's no longer beneficial financially to continue this conflict, it will stop, right? But the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Houthis have no, no moral compunction uh, to continue, right? And so sadly, people, governments like the United States are the ones who can put pressure on, a, on the different warring parties to stop the conflict, right? And so both things are possible at the same time. It could continue as the war as usual, and it could stop tomorrow. And which is a more likely scenario in your view? I mean, this thing with the war in Ukraine has added an element of people bartering other things now all of a sudden, right? With the UAE and the Saudis and, uh, and people positioning themselves in this God knows where the Ukraine is going to go, right? And what knockoff effect that will have on Yemen, I, I don't actually know, right? Like there are now literally too many balls in the air when it comes to- I'm uh, sorry, but uh, another one being the potential for a renewed Iranian nuclear agreement and, and, and the um, consequences that could have for Yemen. Uh, precisely. And, and so, I mean, it, there, there's, there are too many variables right now yeah. to really get, like, if you asked me in February 2015, if it's possible that this, the Saudis would wage war on Yemen, I'll tell you no way in hell. Like, no way in hell. And I had been on the border between Yemen and Saudi Arabia, and Houthi uh, uh, was pointing on the other side. It was like, we don't believe in borders, right? Had the Arab Quran. And uh, uh, we, uh, we will wage war and whatever, right? Like, and they were clear about it. And um, like, and off camera, they were saying something about like next year we'll, we'll be on a tank to Mecca, right? Like they were really quite open about like their expansionist interests in, in the region, right? And I still didn't believe that one, they would actually attack Saudi or that Saudi would actually attack Yemen. And, and so, I mean, I, I would, I'm equal parts optimistic and pessimistic about how this conflict is going because I believe that the Yemeni people don't want this to continue. The majority of the civilians in Yemen are not actively involved in the conflict, right? And so if you, if you wanna talk about the, the fabric of society, right? The society itself is being torn apart because of the conflict, but not that they are all active but they are living the reality of being under different camps, right? And so I believe if the different militias decide that it is no longer beneficial or there is pressure from the outside to stop this conflict, that it can stop, right? And so, and I will, uh, I will use Radhi uh, Al-Mutawakkil's words here, who, who is the director of Muatana for Human Rights in Yemen, uh, it, that uh, it is uh, it is an easy conflict to resolve, right? It is not as complicated as Syria or Iraq or other or other conflicts in the region. It is actually an easy one to resolve. A matter of political will. Absolutely, only political will, yeah. right? And and that's what makes me optimistic. Like it's 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 not that entrenched that it is impossible to to solve. But unfortunately, none of the political parties involved in this have shown any interest in resolving it and wanting to save face, right, by showing a win. And so what is that win, especially when it comes to the Saudis and the UAE, is, is the billion dollar question. Yeah. Safal Ahmed, uh, very much hope that your optimism is is justified by developments uh in the coming months and i'd really like to thank you 
for sharing your insights and expertise with Connections. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Maureen.